Okay, so welcome everybody to the Cognitive Community Meetup. My name is Maria Cruz. I'm a program manager in the Google Open Source Program Office. And uh, we have a few updates today. Uh, if you haven't seen the agenda, you can find it here. Um, we also have a survey. So you can give us feedback on this event. So feel free to fill that out as you have any thoughts throughout the meeting or uh, at any point in time. The survey allows us to make this, uh, to improve this meeting uh, as we go forward. Uh, so without any further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and start. Uh, we have a short update about a public uh, steering committee meeting. Uh, this has been a, a request that has come up from the community several times and uh, yesterday I heard that the steering committee decided that there's going to be a public steering meeting uh, on the third Wednesday of each month, uh, starting next month. So uh, August 19th, I think, would be the first uh, public steering committee meeting that anybody can attend. So if you would like to uh, ask questions to steering or or have a conversation with them, that would be an opportunity to do so. Um, I think this is going to be added to the, uh, to the repo and of, uh, of course also to the, to the Knative Dev website. Um, are there any questions about that? Cool. So I think with that, um, are there any working group updates that we should be sharing with the group right now? I think we have a new release, right? Or... Mm -hmm. Would anybody like to talk about that a little bit? Um, I'm going to call it a bunch of other people for highlights, but um, I think eventing reached V1 on its APIs, which seems like it's kind of a big Yay. deal. Two thumbs up. Yay. I, I see Vila on there. I think he may have, you know, some familiarity, yeah, so you might say. With so, that matter. Right, so let's go around and uh, just name. Really, uh, two minutes, highlight. Release, <clears throat> 16. Uh, yeah, so there's, uh, so we got the eventing uh, bits. Uh, this includes eventing, messaging, and flows to V1. Um, with the discovery API still uh, uh, being defined, we did not move the event types forward because we think they, uh, might be in the discovery API. So um, so that was good, nice. Thanks for all the work for everybody who jumped in. Um, and let's see, um, we have a few other brokers in the work. So I know uh, VMware is working on uh, on a RabbitMQ broker and I know Google is working on Google broker and there's Kafka broker work being done by uh, Red Hat folks, I think it is. Um, so I'm super excited to go and see what uh, what comes out for the next release for that. Um, also, the sources stuff is moving forward as well. Uh, it's getting to, uh, I know uh, Nacho and uh, Lionel have been doing some work there as well. So, is that two minutes? I'm done. Good work, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Can we make put in that link? Uh, release notes for eventing. Serving. I heard something about putting two containers in a pod is a good thing. I can do a quick summary. Um, so there's several new features in serving. Um, serving also has introduced um, a feature flag process to enable people to opt in early to features that we are um, testing. And um, I also want to thank a number of people who, end users who've been contributing to serving by reporting issues um, with things like high CPU usage or high memory usage of various components, particularly at scale. Um, these 
you know, end user when the rubber meets the road sorts of reports are particularly useful to us. And so um, thanks for contributing. These are the sorts of things that, you know, make a difference in people's ability to actually run Knative, but may not be obvious to us when we're running, you know, unit or integration tests that, you know, when you have 2000 services that the memory usage of the webhook reaches a gigabyte, for example. Awesome. Thank you. A multi-container. Did you mention multi-container? A uh, multi-container is one of several um, features that are added in serving. And yep. I'm happy to link to those release notes. But you already did. call out um, rather than specific things like multi-container yep. or downward API, um, ways that we're changing what we ship. And then um, anyone from CLI? Here's the release note for CLI. I saw the, the Twitter go out a day or two. Yeah, so we uh, did a new release there. So we actually we, uh, added some support for broker management, which is which is a good thing. And some UX improvements, which are which are quite um, yeah, I think useful for people like um, allowing a scale option, which sets the min scale and max scale at one at one option. And uh, yes, that's mostly it. So we also have the opportunity, uh, the, the possibility to pick up our resource file directly to create the service, which actually bridges the CLI operations with the resource definitions and files. So this is one of the starts here. Yeah, I think that's that's mostly it. So thanks a lot for all the contributors there. It was really quite a nice release for all sixteen. Thank you. Mm, sorry about that. <laughs> Any anyone else would like to share updates? Any other releases? I I saw Net Courier and Net Istio cut it dot sixteen, but we we no cut release. all of we cut releases for everything for everything. Um, yeah, yeah. But um, I'd actually like to put Paul Mori on the spot if he's available to talk. One second, getting Paul Mori. <laughs> what would you like? Yes, to this about? is Paul Mori speaking. How can I help you? Uh, so Paul's been leading a post mortem on some of our processes, and I thought that that was a really interesting and um, useful exercise. I'd really prefer the term retrospective. Okay, I'm I'm still holding out for like a Frankenstein bolt of lightning that breathes life back into the whole situation. So, fair enough. Anyway, you were saying. Would you like to tell us about it? Uh, yeah, so um, in the last, over the last, I guess, uh, four or five weeks, we have, um, we have been doing a retrospective uh, on different facets of the functions working group um, and like outcome that, uh, that we, weren't I, I don't think anybody was satisfied with the the outcome of the the functions working group and question of project scope uh so we have been i guess we've had three retros now focusing on different layers of this um and the one of one of the things that has received a lot of attention and that we've we've given a lot of attention in this retro process has been what should the scope of Knative, the GitHub project, uh, and GitHub org, and, and what do we see as like the project scope? How will we characterize that? And how does a new idea go from being something that's like perhaps a, a glimmer in someone's eye or a note on a, a napkin um, may not be a 2020 accurate metaphor to use, uh, but um, how do new ideas become part of that project scope? Um, I would say that probably one of the biggest takeaways that I've I've gotten from this this whole experience is that people find the idea of being able to take one of those new ideas and and eventually have it become part of 
what we think the core scope of Knative is to be really meaningful and that the community wants there to be uh, such a path. So um, all of the recordings of those have been posted um, onto the dev mailing list. Uh, perhaps I can forward those to users too for some folks that may not be on the dev list if you want to see how the proverbial sausage is being made. Um, I, I think the next steps are really to, um, to work to refine how we characterize the, the scope. Um, Doug Davis made a, a great characterization that we sort of informally adopted in our last, last retro. And Doug, if you're on, I'd love to have you just say a few words about that if you're willing to do that. But I don't think I see Doug here. That's OK. Uh, this meeting was um, over, overlapping with uh, CNCF serverless. So gotcha. Yeah. So he's, um, he's going to watch us, so say hi to Doug. Well, hello there, Doug. I'll do my best to see if I can capture the gist of, um, of how Doug characterized it, but it's probably best if you want the details to go and watch the recording. Um, let's see, maybe I'll just take a second here and see if I can get that up in front of my eyeballs instead of using the old brain. Um, one of those parts def definitely works better than another. Uh, let's see. One moment. So Scott, Scott is raising his hand right now. Go for it, Scott. I was, it just occurred to me that you, you mentioned the comment that people find it valuable to make a feature and then have it be promoted into what's considered core of Knative. I, I wonder if you've also seen some sort of like ideas start in Knative and get promoted into Kubernetes, same sort of path. Now that's a very interesting question. Um, and Scott, the one that comes to mind that I think we're still sort of figuring out would be bindings. Is that what you're thinking of? But it could be, is it that could be the um, bindings or it could be, uh, it could be uh, some of their other, like our service resource, I could put a C eventually get into K uh, Kubernetes directly. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, maybe I misunderstood the question you were asking. For me, I feel it's, it's valuable, like Knative is an interesting test bed and, uh, uh, but like the end goal would be to improve Kubernetes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I certainly think that like, you know, some of the, some of the concepts and admittedly, this is a bit of a, a tangent, but some of the, the concepts like duct typing and bindings seem like they're maybe very broadly applicable and um, I think it's right and good to to do what we can to see if there's an interest in having those uh, in in cube where they could benefit everybody whether or not they choose to to adopt Knative. Um, going going back to to Doug's uh, characterization um, Let's see. Let, let me see if I can summarize. And if, if I leave anything out, um, uh, anybody can feel free to jump in. So um, maybe I'm actually not up to summarizing this now that I'm reading it. Anyway, Doug, Doug gave a pretty good treatment. Um, I think that the next uh, details really that we have to, to figure out are exactly what, um, you know, what kind of guidance could we give around like what are some things that are maybe necessary but not individually sufficient that uh, project that wants to become part of uh, the Knative GitHub org um, and the core scope have to meet and what sort of process is there for, uh, for you know, if somebody has something that they feel is, is would make a good complementary part of that core scope how would we decide um, in the community whether or not they should be part of it? Um, Evan, do you, do you think that's a decent synopsis of the whole affair? Did I leave anything out? I think so. Um, I think the summary, I tried to summarize um, 
what K-Native is might evolve over time, but we should have clear, um, a clear set of rules as to how we make that decision so that people don't get surprised later. Guidelines, yep. I mean, I think it was sort of a, a balance between clear rubrics and admitting upfront that like, we don't know what we don't know, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah. Um, um, so uh, I, I am actually taking PTO this week and uh, I'll be taking PTO next week. But uh, when I'm back, I'd love to uh, love to have another uh, open discussion to to talk about how the the procedural parts of that story for accepting something into the core scope might work. Cool. Uh, thank you for the update. I, I think I have to interrupt this conversation if that's happening, or maybe just kind of like bring it to a close. But I'm really happy that you shared that uh, update, Paul. Uh, I think it's an important discussion for the Canadian project. Uh, so we can maybe agree to follow up on that on the next uh, community meetup uh, and see where things are at. Um, and now uh, I have to pass the mic on to Carlos, who is going to do a demo. And Carlos, if you have any links uh, that you want to paste on the general chat, I can add them to the agenda. Yeah, I can, I can do that. Uh, let me see. I have a repo here. Um, so yeah, I only, I only have 30 minutes. Uh, can people hear me? Yes. Okay. Let me share my screen. Um, so I'm going to do a demo and this is basically a demo that I did. Um, um, I think it was two weeks ago in the Linux foundation open source summit, North America, 2020, um, <laughs> long name. Um, but the, I was given only 40, 40 minutes. Um, so I, I do, um, some training and some education and some, uh, client engagement. And when it comes to Tecton and, and K native, um, I, I see in our community Slack and, um, also internal Slack, of people asking about CICD or what should be the CICD pipeline for, for K-Native. Um, and I also see uh, folks asking about K-Native. So I, what I tried to do in that, in that conference was um, consolidate kind of to the minimum uh, demo per possible that somebody can just install um, K-Native and Tecton and at the same time use, understand a little bit of what it is. Uh, so I'm not going to do slides today, I'm just going to talk I have, I have slides, you can watch them, it's like two slides. Um, but the, the idea is um, I want to work on, on lowering the barrier to entry for newcomers. So a lot of people, um, including myself, uh, I can say, let's say uh, Carlos, uh, four years ago, didn't know anything about Kubernetes, uh, know a little bit about containers, but that's it. Um, so I think uh, there's a lot of people uh, these days with that, at that level, that they feel intimidated when they, they try to learn these new new tools or components that they have to like install a big cluster or they maybe they don't they don't try it out because they think it will take them a week to install or it will take them days to configure or if they mess up a cluster. So what I what I tried to do was create something very simple that is uh, super easy to install. So people can actually see somebody else doing it. So because a, a lot of times we see demos and, and we just see like, oh, I installed this software, let's move on, let's explain the software. But a lot of people get stuck. We do leave a lot of people behind like, well, how do I install it in my laptop? How do I delete it? How, do, well, how much do I need? So that's what I'm going to go over and, and maybe this is a good recording for folks uh, watching the recording. So um, as a message to those that are watching, if you're not live in the meetup, uh, we caught the jokes and the bloopers. So you're, you're missing, so attend the next one. Um, um, so um, this is uh, try to do a markdown. You can with Kubernetes. This is going to Kubernetes. You don't have to be an expert in Kubernetes or YAML uh, for this. Um, so you can pick. Um, I have three. I have Karakora. You can go into Karakora and just and just run something. And I don't know why this is not opening. Let me move this out of the way. Um, um, you can get a pre-clustering IBM. Uh, very. It's very small. It's like two gigs uh, for CPU, but um, 
and then I'm going to do the mini cube. Also, you can use kind if you want want to do kind. But uh, um, so what I did, I I'm trying to see also, for example, for demo purposes and for educational purposes, when I give a class, what is the minimum amount of resources that you need on your laptop to to run these type of things um, that you just want to learn. So for this example, I'm going to use just serving and, and Tekton. So two CPUs and two gigs is good enough. So if you have a laptop that can do that, uh, that's okay. I already did, so I already have like uh, a Kubernetes cluster running with the minimum thing that I did, and I just literally did this uh, before starting. Um, next thing is you have to have, so if you see a line, so if this CLI basically give you an abstraction um, to do imperative programming or setup of the of this of these tools, um, but at the same time take into account that this is also can be done in a declarative way. Uh, for example, configuration as code, aka uh, YAML. And then um, you will need a container registry. I'm using um, a Docker uh, registry. So this, um, if it's not apparent, um, the these whole tools uh, are evolve around co containers. Um, so I'm going to use Docker because that's a common one, but you can use any registry out there. Um, and set up Git, just git clone this repo. So let's get started with installing Tekton. So a lot of people ask like how difficult to install Tekton. Uh, there's an operator, but I'm going to just install uh, the YAML. And then you run you run these commands, basically this install the, the CRDs and install a couple of um, pods. Uh, they don't consume a lot of CPU and it should not take that long to install. So um, um, we have good documentation in the Knative uh, um, site, uh, but sometimes um, I, I do this so I can tell folks, hey, go here and uh, this is just one instance of, of, of getting something working, right? It's not the only, only way. So, uh, that took 27 seconds, so um, also to showcase some of the improvement that people have done around the project of the styling experience. Um, the next thing that we need is a courier. A courier is a uh, the networking part that Knative configures. So uh, back in the days was only Istio, so these days it's a plugin architecture. So we have uh, courier, uh, Istio, uh, Contour, uh, Glue. So all of them are in the in the in the documentation. I'm using Curry because it's, it's it's tiny and it's and was easy to get it get it up. Uh, all of them, I guess, they're easy. But this is like I said, one example. Um, I'm going to be using uh, no ports. That's very simple. Um, again, this this tutorial was to make it very easy for folks to get started. So uh, Curry set up. Um, I'm going to get my some of the environment variables. Let me put this here. Uh, Maria, can you see my, my screen okay or should I make it bigger? A little bit bigger. Uh, I think it's good, yeah. Uh, I don't want this to be uh, tiny. So I'm going to source some um, environment variables there in the GitHub repo. So my, um, my I created a namespace because sometimes you get given a cluster and you're given a, a namespace so you can uh, play in that in that namespace. Uh, so in this case, my, mine is called demo. Uh, I'm using the nip.io. Um, so I already did this. One thing that we have to do is is patch tell Kubernetes about this domain name. Um, so um, I can patch I can patch it. The next thing is for courier to work in this uh, environment. I need to access some port 80. So I'm going to create a a like um, another service that give me a no port um, on that external IP and I'll be able to access that. Um, then um, we have to tell Knative about if are you going to use Istio, are you going to use Glue? So in this case, we're going to say, please Knative, when you want to configure the networking, uh, correct, go ahead and create ingress resources for, for Courier to pick up. And that's it. Um, that's, that's the stuff I also wanted to show to, to users that even if you're watching, it just took me like five minutes to have Knative install. Um, since this is what's about Tekton, um, I, I also like uh, snuck in like um, for Knative, but some people don't know what Knative is or they haven't seen a demo or they cannot run a demo. So uh, what I did was um, um, created a kind of like Knative uh, quick demo to showcase some of the 
features. Um, so for example, I, I like to use the, the CLI for when I'm like hacking things. So the CLI got updated to dot 16. We were just talking about dot 16. So all this is running the latest version of uh, uh, Knative. Um, so I can create a, 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 a Knative service with just a container. Um, I can give it a window of like how fast do you want to scale down. Uh, but the CLI give you like a quick way um, to get to get started from a container to a URL, for example. Uh, so in the second part, we're going to see tech done, how we can get source code into a container. Because so that's the second question that everybody asks is like, uh, how do I get my code into a container so then Knative can use it? Um, so since this is a brand new cluster, I just did a minikube delete. Um, it doesn't have the, the image uh, cache. So that's why it takes a little bit of time the first time. Uh, and I think that, let me see if, I, uh, if it works. So if I do this, um, I see that is, it says that it's ready and I get a URL. So if I went from a container registry having a container to a URL, basically, I don't know if people are timing me, maybe I'm talking too much. Um, and this will be faster if you're trying yourself. Uh, but we can just um, hit it, right? I open that that domain name and it says, hello world. So let me do it again um, to make this bigger. Um, and that's kind of like the, the aspect of it. But the things that is run, the, the thing about Knative is on the background, there's a bot running um, and when I'm not hitting it, it's terminating. So I just use a flag to make it faster for the demo, but the pod is gone. Um, we don't have any pods, there's no instance. Uh, so it's still, still terminating. At that point, Kernative tell Kubernetes, go ahead, delete this pod. Um, and it should be gone in a few seconds, but it's not going to consume time. So that's the, that's the what we people, some people call serverless, right? The serverless aspect of Knative. And that's kind of like the quick demo if you don't have a lot of time. Uh, just to watch a quick demo, I got it. I got Knative installed. So um, I don't know if I'm going to have a, a lot of time here, but I also want to show uh, another nifty thing that what was playing with the CLI I was able to, to figure out was um, what about if I want to update something about that service? So for example, an environment variable, I can do it with the CLI, right? I can say update my that service and uh, now I have a new revision uh, let's call it V1, I'm calling this one V1. And now if I call it um, my, the, the app, now I'm calling the, my new revision of that, of that service. So now it says hello V1. And that's okay, but what about if we want to do uh, traffic splitting? Um, I'm not using Istio, by the way. I'm using Cur, so I, you can get this just with the Cur gateway. Um, so I'm going to create, update the service now, and I'm going to create a revision saying, I want to create a new revision and send maybe not the whole traffic, but 25% of the traffic um, and leave 75, the rest of the traffic to the old V1. So that way I'm able to do traffic splitting um, in, other, in other tools. So this is an abstraction. So, um, so if we describe it, um, you will see, I'm also doing a demo of the CLI. You will see that the, the information about the revision, you will see the 75 and the 25 splits and the URL. So if I call it the URL, uh, let's say for in a loop, um, you will see that most of the requests are going to be going into uh, V1 and then V2 will get a few. So this is a, a common practice when you're rolling out a new software that you roll out small percentage of, of, the, of the traffic to that new one. If it looks, looks good, uh, then you move forward. So as you can see, V1 is getting more, more traffic. But what about if we want to do something even like um, beyond that? Let's say that I have a, a new version of the of my application. I'm going to configure something, but I don't want to. I don't know. I don't want anyone to see it uh, by default. Um, so let's say that I run this command, and this what it's going to do is leave the 75 percent, 25 percent to v2, and then the latest will get zero percent. And you will ask like. Well, if it gets zero percent, how do I access uh, access this app? So this is what is called Canary deployment or Dart launch. Um, I still don't want to everybody to get it, but I'm going to be able to get it in a second. So um, if we describe it, um, so describe is 
common command even in Kubernetes to describe a, a resource. So in this case, you see zero to the latest 25 and 20, 25 to V2, 75 to V1. So we call it, um, um, so it's not available. It's getting 0%, but because I'm using tags, one cool way, one cool thing that is happening is Knative is giving me a, 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 a domain name that has the V3 tag in there. So I actually, I can access uh, that revision, but my users will not access that revision. So I can go ahead in a loop um, and then still V1 and V2. And if I'm happy with it, um, after testing it, or maybe um, I get testers or I test it myself, I can update with the CLI and say, make the latest revision 100%. Um, so that way um, I, can, I can access it. Um, and I can see 100% of it. So now I can go to the app and instead of seeing V1 and V2, I only see V3, uh, that is the latest one. And, and again, this is the flexibility of, of Knative and this is like one of the reasons people ask like if I'm using K Kubernetes, how, what are the things that Knative is going to bring? So you see some of the abstraction and the, and the fast way I can uh, get this working. I can also do something like this, right? I can say, Oh, there was a problem with V3. Um, I think we should go to V1. I can say, well, V1 now gets uh, the traffic. So all the revisions are live in the cluster. They live in the cluster. Um, so I can run the loop again and we're both rolling back. So this is what we call like rolling back to a version that was working. So with that, um, um, the, the thing is, this is what I, what I said is, if I now, because I'm using tagging, which is very cool, I can access any of the versions and basically it's going to, it's going to bring up the pods on demand serverless and they're available V1, V2, and V3. But in this case, one of them is, is latest, uh, but they're always available and you can roll back um, and you can roll forward and you can manage that. In other software scenarios, this is, gets very complex. So this is what I think the community here in Canada is doing to, to address. So some folks um, that are not familiar with it, um, it's hard to, to comprehend between all the noise or what you get there. So, um, and, and that's it. So this is, I just, just did the demo with the CLI, but there's, there's YAML behind it. So you can, all, all it, everything that I did, you can declare the YAML in Kubernetes uh, API uh, resources. So I can declare a V1, a V2, and V3, and I can declare my split of percentages, my traffic there. So this is a very small version of the YAML. You were going to do it with, like raw Kubernetes or uh, other tools, um, it will be a lot of configuration. So that's what Knative is giving you. So um, that's, that's the idea and you can deploy them, deploy the YAML, I'm going to do it here. And then you're back to it. So you can do it declarative and imperative. So um, at that point, I'm going to just ask uh, maybe uh, one minute um, for feedback. Um, I, this is something I wanted to show also here in the community to see Sometimes we are, we're asked to demo Knative and I was looking for like, uh, what would be the fastest way that I can like uh, get somebody interested or just understand what the project is and a fast way to do it. So uh, any questions, any feedback, a &A, uh, before continuing? Or, or nobody's listening? It's... Or there's chance. Um, I was gonna say it's a, it's a very nice, clear demo. Okay, yeah, and I, I think um, here in the in the meetup, um, everybody's from, from Knative, so this is like uh, what you do every day. But um, at least this is recorded, so if somebody asks you for for a demo or like something, now you don't have to do it, then it's done. <laughs> um, I really I like I, that you focused on the CLI. It gives a different perspective for everybody who's in the Kubernetes. Um, ecosystem that for users who are not familiar with actually Kubernetes, there is a CLI that can actually, you can use. And I, I really like this entry as opposed to go YAML first. Yeah, uh, that's, that, was, that was the idea to, to start, start with the CLI, but also show that there's declarative uh, way behind it, right? Um, and also I didn't want to show all features of Knative because then we'll be becoming a long demo and I didn't have that much time. Uh, which I don't have here, but I'll move to Tecton next. Uh, go ahead, Evan. Oh, I was just going to say the CLI is great for 
demoing and experimenting. And then when you move to production, people generally, that's when people want to have things in YAML so they can code review what's going on. Exactly, exactly. Yep, yep. Um, and I think so, there's a, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was going to say it's the same paradigm that we, I do even for kubectl. I do things imperative with kubectl, round dash dash rm. And then once I know what is working, I save it to Git as declarative code. Go ahead, Maria. Um, there was a question on the chat, uh, I think from Alex. Uh, any plans to add Knative eventing to tutorial uh, and use Knative client? Uh, yes. So um, I didn't do it one because it would make I this was focused for that for that presentation. Um, so I didn't want to add eventing. Uh, also, K native uh, CLI. One, I want I want to highlight the same thing with the K native CLI. So I think the re the recent release has the things that I wanted to show with the CLI and show the YAML. So um, yeah, I can I can add that and also looking into uh, the the resources. If I add K native eventing. I think the dispatcher is asked for one more CPU, so I would need like three CPUs instead of two CPUs. That's something I also want to uh, go back to the community to have a demo version or just have one command that, that patches the, the request, but um, I would need more CPU. And the free cluster that I get in IKS is two, in IBM is two CPUs. I, so yeah, the, ne the, the, short answer, the short answer is yes, I'm going to give like a, some similar hello world of Knative eventing. The M memory controller dropped the um, requests and limits uh, last release or the release before. So hopefully it's a smaller footprint. Yeah. And, and this is for demo purposes, right? Take into account this is, I want to run this like even in Raspberry Pi or a vegan, vegan thing. Um, so let's move to Tecton. I think uh, even I think during the beginning of the meetup, I was asking about Tecton. So how the same concept of Tecton, like how difficult it is. It takes a week, it takes one day to install Tecton? Do I need to buy a cluster? Do I need to like uh, put a credit card? No, it's, it's the same thing. Uh, you can start very simple installing the same way I did with, with Knative. So let's install Tecton. I'm still using my two CPUs, right? I haven't gone my budget for my, my two CPUs and my two gigs of memory. So um, I have worked with folks that don't have computers that have a lot of memory. So even to try things is a, a barrier to entry. So that's why I want to do the demos with the mono uh, memory. So for Tecton, you have to install the Tecton pipelines. The Tecton is in GitHub. Uh, they have a, a project called Pipelines. Um, so you install that one. It gives you a webhook and a controller. Um, also, there's a dashboard that is, I make it optional so because sometimes I just use the CLI. I don't use the, the UI. Also, sometimes I use OpenShift and OpenShift has their own UI. Uh, but the dashboard is kind of nice to have it, so let's, let's put it in there, and it also fits, doesn't consume that much uh, memory. Um, to access this uh, UI, I usually use it not for like configuring things, but just to watch, um, watch, watch what's, what's available, the same thing people should do with the Kubernetes dashboard. Um, so the dashboard is there. So let me create a, a service that exposes the no port so I can access it. Um, that way I can get a URL um, and I can open this URL and say, it's a, uh, a way to like see what is the pipeline, what are the tasks are running, task run. So I usually do task run, um, task run or pipeline run. So I get, I get Tecton installed. So sometimes we spend, because that's our work as platform people or tool people, we spend a lot of time working the stall process and talking about the stall process. And some users really like, I don't care. I just need to install it, right? It should work. Um, so that's, that's kind of the net of it. You install it and you move out of the way. Um, I already have the Tecton CLI TKN. Um, and let's verify if it's working. This is kind of a step I put in there uh, to see if everything's working. So my pods are working. I uh, have the dashboard, I have pipelines, and I have the, the service. So in terms of um, people ask like, which CI CD pipeline do I use for Knative? Well, Knative is uh, for the most part, runs on Kubernetes um, is, you have to build a container. So any, any tool, CI CD tool that allows you to take source code and convert that source code into a container, um, it works with Knative. Um, if, um, so uh, we'll hold on for the second part on how to do deploy the application for So building, um, 
for the credentials, um, I need to, I'm going to create a, the idea is I'm going to take some source code and push it into the container registry. In this case, it could be Quile, Docker registry, I, uh, a Google registry, Amazon registry, your own private registry, IBM registry, anyone. But then it doesn't matter because uh, Tecton, what it's doing is taking the, the source code and converting, com, converting that into an archive, a container registry, and then pushing it there. Um, so I already have the secret created. I just put my username and password for, for Docker Hub. So I have the secret there. The steps are here. You can run it and it'll give you the, the thing. And then, then Tecton needs a, is a, a service account because it would uh, run these uh, pipelines or tasks, these CI CD jobs uh, with a service account. So we have to create one and associate it with this, with this secret. So because it's going to be the one uh, that is going to deploy. Um, and then um, this step is to configure the RBAC because later we're going to use Tecton to deploy, do like basically do kubectl. So it needs access to a Kubernetes resource. I give it permission to say, hey, you can create a Knative resource basically to deploy. So I'm going to create that. That's just an RBAC. It's, I created a resource, uh, uh, a role base. So that way, if people only have access to one namespace or one project in terms of OpenShift, they don't need cluster role. So that's another misconception that you need like cluster admin. Uh, for certain things, you can just do it in a namespace um, or project. So the building, building um, Tecton task. So a task is the in Tecton, it, it will take our source code that it leaves in, let's say in this GitHub repo. I happen to put both the source code and the pipelines in the same repo as best practice. You will separate those, but for demo purposes, this is a Node.js app, but in case I put a protocol Node.js, you can change this repo and put here Go, Java, Python, any language you want. So basically it's going to take this source code and convert it into an image. Um, in this case, um, there's no imperative way of creating these, these tasks because at the end of the day, with Tecton, basically you are like writing a bunch of scripts and running them in, in, in sequence. So in Tecton, what we call that is a task. So you're going to create a task this task takes parameters, like your input parameters. Uh, one, thing, one thing to take into account, the latest versions of Tecton, they deprecated uh, the pipeline resources, like the image or the Git. So everything now is simpler. It just use parameters for everything, the, the image URL, the Git URL, the revision and everything. So this task does two things. It will do a Git clone of the GitHub repo and then put that in a, in a volume mount that is empty directory is sharing the same thing and then run a, an utility. So this utility could be a binary like Scanico or build uh, or something that would take source code and convert it to image like source to image or S2I. Um, but that's to some developers that you know, it's not even important. I have code in, a fo code in a folder. You can even just build back right to detect uh, what type of um, language you have at the end of the day, it will give you back a container. Um, so to deploy it, that's where you will need kubectl. So you will run kubectl and deploy the task. Um, after that, then you can use the Tecton CLI to list the task. So let me put this on the top. So I'm, list, I'm listing the task. Also describe the, the build, my task. So you will, can describe the build and it will tell you what are the input parameters. So I need the GitHub URL, um, and then where do I where where do I going to send that image? Um, but I'm going to pass that as a parameter uh, with the Tecton CLI. So with the Tecton CLI, I can start a task run or an instance of this task, um, and I'm going to pass the repo URL and basically convert a URL to an image. And this is kind of the concept that we had back in the days in Knative. When Knative started, it had a component called Knative Build, which basically what you were able to configure declarative the source code URL, and then it will convert that into an image. Uh, but that project, I guess, matured and uh, the broader scope, um, and then it, it, that got converted into Tecton. So if I start this uh, with this command line, and I'm going to, sp I'm specifying the, the folder, which is Node.js, and the service account, which is pipeline. And this um, will start a pod. At the end of the day, this is running pods. It's kind of like serverless also. Uh, serverless CI CD, it will launch a pod, run these two containers for the Git clone, and then converting the image and pushing the image. And then the pod will complete and it will stay there and not consuming any memory or CPU. So, as you can see, it already did the. So, I'm envy with them because they have colors and a K Native CLI doesn't have colors. 
so that's just um, something that I, I, I wish we had in K Native. And I, I think that's also possible to add, not a problem. But um, so it's doing the first task, which is the Git clone. And the second one is the one that takes more time. And you can optimize this with better way of um, managing your Docker files or the tool that you're using or caching into a volume and such. But for this demo, I don't think it takes more than a minute uh, to build. So I think that's OK uh, to wait a minute. So basically, you already did the Docker build. So now it's pushing to my container registry. So it's pushing to docker.io, uh, this namespace, and this, the, this that. So this is, this is when people ask about CICD, is find, finding a tool or finding a DevOps CICD pipeline that will convert a URL, take source from a URL, convert it into an image, um, and then push it. So it got done in one minute and 20 nine seconds. Um, I can double check if the image is there uh, with a curl, just if we want to do it, or just talk, go to Docker Hub. I'm going to go over that. So that's it. You're done with the build. So this is the part of, of, of Tekton that is, is, is you're writing scripts, and you run, run them in sequence. And this is one task, and it's reusable. Um, so that's a reusable part of Tekton. The second part is, how do I deploy now this image? I can go back to do a KN service create, or I can maybe use something like Flux or Argo. Um, those are declarative things that would do a GitOps approach, or um, you can also run like a script using Tekton. So in this case, I have a Tekton task that basically takes a GitHub URL that I have the, the YAML uh, that points to this image that is going to point to this image. And basically it's going to do the same thing to a task with two steps. First one does the git, git clone of the source code that have my YAML. One of the inputs is the, the directory where the YAML is, the, the YAML file name. Um, and basically does a kubectl apply. So this is why I did the RBAC. So um, if the, you specify an image, then I'm going to replace the image in the service.yaml with the new image because on um, that's part of the demo, the purpose is like every time you do a commit to the Git repository, I want another immutable image with a tag associated to the Git commit. Um, so let's deploy the deploy task. Um, again, keep CTO apply. So I now should have two tasks. I should have a build and a deploy task. Um, so I have the build and deploy. And I can just uh, describe the deploy again, showing showcasing the the Tekton CLI. They put the parameters here. You see the steps that it takes, and it has a. I didn't notice it has a feed uh, put there. Um, and the, any task I run, I haven't run a task run yet. Um, so this is uh, this is the YAML that we're going to deploy. So basically, you put anything that you want in those in those scripts. Um, there's just bash scripts. Scripts to apply. Um, so this is the YAML that is uh, the Knative service. So you see service, but it's, it's under Knative. So this is a Knative service, much shorter, and you have an image, and it has our, our environment variable. So if we start this, um, it should start another pod, um, ephemeral, and passing the, the directory where my Knative is and my service. So I think I had a link here uh, to that. I can even show that here. And you can have one YAML, multiple YAML files, uh, so this is the one that I'm deploying. So I'm deploying this. It happens to be in the same repository. As I said, best practice is to have it separate. Uh, but yes, that, it took 13 seconds. So how fast does it take to take uh, to deploy with Tekton or deploy Knative is just launching a pod, running a kubectl command. And these tests, these steps I didn't mention are running in containers. So you decide uh, the container that you want to use. So it should have the utility. So in this case, I'm using one that I created with kubectl and JQ, um, and you can use it, it's open source, um, and it's out there. Um, let me go back if the, this little window allow me to, to move here. Um, so I have my two tasks, um, and my, my Knative demo uh, app is deploy. So I basically did one task to create the image, one task to deploy, and I should be able to, uh, again, uh, call my new app and it says, welcome to Knative Meetup, which I updated that in a few minutes ago into to the YAML. Um, and to finish, um, I'm going to talk about pipelines. So pipelines is how do I put two tasks together uh, to work in parallel, to be executed in parallel 
of VS Security in Serially. So uh, yeah, you declare this as a YAML file. So you declare a pipeline that is going to take some input parameters, for example, the GitHub URL, uh, the image that you're going to uh, send it, maybe the image tag. Now it's important because every time I want to do a Git commit, I want a, a new image tag with that Git hash or seven, seven first characters. And I'm going to specify the two tasks. The first task is the build that we just saw, and the second one is the deploy. Um, and basically, it's going to run them sequentially. You can stitch them by results or just saying run after build. So I did run after build, and then you uh, deploy the pipeline. So this is where most of the like real uh, projects happen. Ruin pipelines, the tasks are like composable things. So it's a composable framework. Um, I can use the CLI to list it or describe it. Um, so this is a build and deploy. So it's describing it, the input parameters, it lists the tasks that it's doing, and then what are, what are the things that it run. Um, if I want to run it from the pipe, from the CLI, I can also do it imperative. I can, I can run it. Basically, I'm passing the, the image um, URL where I want to deploy, and the repo URL, which is my, my repo. And it's going to run the two tasks instead of I did it manually before. It's going to run one after the other um, using the same image. Um, and then again, it will take a minute to do that. And then we'll be able to see our K-native um, application. And then lastly is the automation because it gets tired by running this thing manually. Every time you push something to Git or just submit a PR, um, that's where like a second, comp another component, I guess the third component of Tekton is Tekton triggers. Um, Tekton triggers basically helps you create kind of like a little pod that can uh, receive the Git webhooks, and it could be GitLab, Bitbucket, GitHub, um, basically anything that would trigger this this pipeline. Um, so if you install it, let's see if that's that's finished. I'm going to skip because I'm taking uh, uh, a lot of time uh, over over my budget. Um, so <laughs> let's give it a time uh, for this to finish, and I will talk a little bit more about about the triggers. So triggers. Um, is a way that you can bind um, when you receive a Git a Git request. You have a template. So this, uh, this the template is what are the things that you want to create resources. Uh, oh, so it's done. So it took a minute and a half. So now is is updated, and I was able to create the pipeline. So let me install the Tekton triggers. If you install the Tekton triggers, this is a separate component. So you can decide if you want it or not. Um, so if you need uh, trigger the pipelines with a with a URL uh, endpoint, then you can do that. Um, so that's the Tekton um, triggers. And and basically what you need is a trigger template that says when I GitHub, it's a Git event happens, I want you to create these resources. So I want you to like run a pipeline with these input parameters. In this case, I'm passing the, the revision um, in case of um, uh, will be the, the revision, the URL, and then the tag, uh, which is um, the, the first truncated uh, shasm. So this is a nice thing that, that Tekton has. Uh, so I'm going to, be going to replace it because I want to say uh, what is the image that I wanted to use. And then it has a binding, and that's the second component. It's like when I receive a GitHub webhook, how do I extract things from the uh, HTTP body of that Git webhook? Um, so I can get, get the commit ID. In this case, is this is a format for GitHub, the URL, but also it has an extension that I can um, going to show of how how can I use Tekton to tell it, hey, run some logic in their declarative. So let's do uh, the binding. So this is what is called Tekton binding, and then the event trigger. This is basically putting that pod in place. Um, Here's the YAML. Again, this uh, a lot of YAML. <laughs> uh, but basically what you're saying is, um, I want a, a service or a pod to spin up. And it's going to process uh, GitHub events, in this case, uh, push, or I can say, which ones I want with a, with a cell, which is, this is a, a, a way of declarative way of doing some logic in here. And that is coming from master. So I can scope it to push and master. I can also take the git commit and just truncate it to the seven characters. So that would be my image tag. So every time there's a GitHub hap, git commit happens, I want a new image with a new git 
GitHub, um, the git commit uh, hash, but only the seven characters because if it's long, it's not, it's annoying. So um, I'm going to create this and this will spin up a pod configure with this configuration that is going to put the, the two things together, the binding and the template. Um, if we, we double check, um, this uh, is up and running. So it's a little pod, doesn't consume that much resources. You can have one per repo, you can configure it multiple places, and then you can configure uh, GitHub. Uh, so in this case, I'm going to um, expose it to a node port so I can access it. Um, and then um, I'm going to get the GitHub URL. Like if, if GitHub can access my laptop, it will work, but I, uh, you can use a Kubernetes cluster free or paid that is on the cloud. Or you can use inlets. I point out inlets is something that you can like get traffic from the internet into your laptop. So I'm not going to show how to add this in in here because I already did it. Uh, but you can test it with Coral, so you can like emulate uh, that GitHub um, uh, events. So I can like it's a push. Um, so I just trigger the pipeline and it's running. And actually, um, I can even see it in the in the tecton here. Uh, uh, when, when it's running, let me see this one is, I think it's this one. This one is an I guess So it's running in the UI. So that's, that's triggered in that. I can, I can also show, uh, where I already did it in the GitHub URL. So if you're doing this lab, basically follow the instructions and go into settings. Um, and you click webhooks and you can do this programmatically also. I added, I added one to a uh, free Kubernetes cluster that I have online in IBM. Uh, so I have, a, I have a second like environment like this because I wanted to test online. Um, so basically you just edit this and put the GitHub URL either using inlets to your Mac or uh, your Kubernetes cluster. And every time something happens in Git, I can change something that will start a, a new change. So um, I can go ahead and change something about the, the application. So I can say um, something like changing the code. So now it becomes I only focus on my source code, my Java, Python, Go code. Um, and I can put here, um, thanks for watching the demo video, right? Um, and this would trigger um, I'm going to just commit the master like, like YOLO, right? And this would trigger uh, the pipeline. Um, in this case, I'm pointing to my other cluster. So it started building my uh, container. It's going to deploy the app in that namespace. And then my new app should be available in one minute. So I can do this for PRs and to a separate namespace or when I merge to master to deploy to staging or production. So I hope this, this demo is useful for folks getting started into this space, that it feels a little bit intimidated, right? That you need a lot of resources or a powerful computer or a, or a wallet. It's super easy to get started and, and follow along. So um, I think I'm over my 30 minutes, Maria. Uh, you, <laughs> yes. Um, uh, yeah, but thank you so much uh, for- Any questions this demo. in the chat or? Well, the chat, uh, there were several questions and people were uh, responding to them. And there was a conversation about updating uh, community samples. Um, I think we might need to, yeah. to leave questions for the Slack uh, yeah. because we, yeah, we are over time. Oh, I lost the screen. Here we go. So uh, thank you so much for, for offering that, uh, that demo presenting. This will be available. Uh, later on today or tomorrow on the Give Me YouTube channel. Uh, I think now we are going to go to the last part of our agenda. Uh, I think Chris uh, Devona has joined us. Uh, hi, Chris. Hello. I don't know if you can um, hear me okay. Yes, we can hear you. Um, and this is the section where we, uh, the, if, if anybody has any questions about Open Usage Commons organization, uh, I would like to ask Chris about trademarks, uh, for Knative, et cetera. 
uh, this is the moment to do so. There's, there's a space in the agenda where I invited the community to post any questions. This is at the end. Um, so we can start there or we can start, Chris, if you want to start with uh, anything else, uh, feel free to do so as well. Sure, I just figured I would introduce uh, how we came about to create the OUC um, and give a little, the, the four minute little intro uh, that I've been giving everybody in the world, it seems. Um, so if you can hear me well, I'm, I'm not going off my optimal setup here, so I apologize. Um, but if you can hear me well, I'm just gonna get started. And then, you know, four or five minutes from now, I'll start walking down the uh, questions that people have put in the doc, which is great. Uh, I will say, uh, there's one that's that's kind of baffling to me, and I might ask the anonymous tiger, cat, dog, bird, or whatever, uh, to to help me with that one. But yeah, let me let me get started. So, um, I'm Chris. I've been at Google since 2004, working on releasing open source software patches, uh, and representing Google to various open source organizations and foundations uh, for a very long time. Um, when I first got here, we had had some patching activity uh, starting in 1999 into the Linux kernel uh, and some other, you know, haphazard contributions. Um, but we, we started a path of formalization, uh, initially releasing four projects, and then now we release between eight and 15 projects a day uh, into open source software under real open source licenses. Um, Alex, go ahead and put it in the uh, in, in the doc so I can get to it. Otherwise, I'll, I'm going to be useless to you. Um, so, um, what this means uh, is that so over the last 15 years or so, uh, we've released about 13,000 projects, of which 3,000 is uh, um, our seven-day active and 30-day active in terms of getting contributions, updates. Pull requests, that, that sort of thing. Uh, I don't need to tell any of you what it means to be an active project. Uh, and so uh, of those, uh, we've also donated some to foundations. So we've donated uh, lock, stock and barrel uh, trademark copyright patents to about 12 or 13 projects of the 3,000 30-day actives into foundations where we work on projects like Kubernetes, gRPC, uh, you know, uh, AMP actually went into a, a foundation recently. And then uh, things like, gosh, WASM, you know, I think would be relevant to, to your community. They went to the W3C, where we've been a member since 2006, uh, and the rest. So. Yeah, so what this all means, is I'm not trying to, you know, put on airs or, or stand up on some high mountain saying, how look at how great we are. That's, that's not the point of this. The point of this is we end up hitting every problem in intellectual property kind of before any other company does. Um, if you look at, you know, the various lawsuits brought against Google around intellectual property that have an open source component, whether it was around Courgette and the Chrome auto updaters or the rather prominent Oracle lawsuit, um, you know, they all had an element of open source implicated or inside them. And one of the places we've seen in the last two to five years has been uncertainty around trademark usage of, of the projects that we release. So Google currently has about 85 registered and what we call common law trademarks uh, for our prominent open source projects. These are, uh, you know, uh, legion in the company and so we've also been getting uh, a lot of questions about how people can use those trademarks in commerce and in their distributions of these softwares so whether it's something like istio angular or garrett they all have had people come to us say hey you know we, we we're using this and we're shipping it to third parties we're selling services around them um you know how, how can we use the, the 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 trademark the the logo the name but the the mascot in in many cases and while we sort of counted on the apache license to express our intent as a company around uh non-copyright non-patent uh you know intellectual property uh like you saw on sitemaps 
like you saw in uh, in a variety of uh, hardware related and and trademark related uh, intellectual property. It's the, the fact of the matter is open source licenses simply don't cover trademarks. Uh, the Apache license is the closest one that comes close to acknowledging the existence of trademarks. And it says specifically that it doesn't deal with them. So you end up having to come back to the trademark holder, in this case, Google, uh, for a lot of folks. So what we decided to do is create a new organization called the Open Usage Commons. I was originally thinking about calling it the Corner Case Commons, but nobody would get the joke. And uh, yeah, so we created the Open Usage Commons. Uh, we, we just literally just started this thing with, um, uh, with Charles Isbell, who's the CSD in at Georgia Tech, Cliff Lampy, who is over at University of Michigan, Allison Randall, who I think some of you must know uh, from her travels in open source, and Miles Ward, who's sort of our voice of the customer uh, on the board of directors. So there's six people, two Googlers, myself and Jen Phillips, and then four non-Googlers. Uh, we all have equal votes, so it's not some, you know, sock puppet organization like some others. Will any and vendor, just a, a question on that point really quick, will any vendor be able to join the board of directors of the OUC? So we think that the board of directors will probably grow um, over time. You know, we're, we're just still in the setting of the bylaws part of the organization. You know, the reality of being at Google is when you start something externally, you have to manage, you know, talking to reporters and, and all the rest, but we're just getting started. Um, you know, one thing that, um, you know, we, we think is uh, relevant is that will there be subcommittees around the individual marks? Uh, so, so the whole point of, of the OEC is to create trademark guidelines consistent with the open source definition. Um, so, you know, and then for individual marks that have demands beyond that, we would have an escalation committee that would be staffed from the steering committees or from the, you know, the lead committers of those projects, um, you know, to handle escalations. So that's another place where I think we would see vendors, you know, but I should point out, this is not a vendor organization. This is not designed to replace a Linux foundation or a CNCF, you know, which is a benevolent corporation designed sort of like a change, chamber of commerce to represent its members. You know, we're specifically trying to create guidance for any project to use, whether they're in the OUC or not, around how to, you know, maintain trademarks consistent with the OS date. So I don't know if that really answers your question, but yeah. I mean, it it sort of doesn't. Uh, the reason that I ask about the board of directors is that if we really, if if you want OUC to have the perception of neutrality. I would imagine that uh, it's important for anybody be, to be able to have a seat at the table of the board of directors, similar to how okay. you know you can join the Linux Foundation, et cetera. That's that's yeah. sort of so what I'm you can join the Linux Foundation, but you're not in charge of the board of directors just by joining. I mean, so listen, the Linux Foundation is is the Linux Foundation. Um, the only thing that's going to prove neutrality of the board of directors of the OUC will be time. You know, the people who aren't going to trust us no matter what are not going to come to trust us a couple of years from now. Um, you know, so the reason we composed the board in the fashion we did is that we wanted people who had the best interests of computer science and open source at heart, you know, and, you know, people can either trust us or not. I, I kind of don't care, you know. So the real question is, is there a relevant place for other vendors in that rubric? And I think the answer is yes. And I think that you know, ask me in three to six months when we've got more road under our feet. Okay. Anyways, I'm happy to go to questions now. Um, the other thing I would like to mention is, you know, the, the neutrality of the organization is really paramount for people to understand. So not only did we make it so that, you know, Google has only one third of the votes of the board of directors, but also, you know, Google can never, ever own more than 49% of an external body like this without invoking all kinds of uh, rules and regulations around our antitrust posture. So it was really important to us that not only are we not owning um, a majority share of this thing, um, we're also not voting even more than a third in the current structure. So, you know, neutrality is a legal thing for me that's really important. It, 
doesn't really matter if people like it or not. You know, it's the reality is someone like Charles Isbell and Cliff Lampe are frankly are above reproach. And so is Allison. Even if you think that me and Jen are corrupt or whatever, and, and you think that, uh, you know, that Miles is somehow, you know, because he used to be a Googler is in our pocket, which is hilarious. Um, you know, I really think that, you know, Charles and Cliff and, and Allison really stand above. So, uh, anyways, questions. So there are some questions here. Uh, where's the page? Okay, uh, relation of, that's not really a question. Um, OEC equals open usage, yeah, sure. Uh, relationship of the OEC in regards to the CNCF, if Knative was in the CNCF, well, Knative is not in the CNCF, so I don't know really how to answer that. Um, the CNCF has been pretty hostile to the creation of the Open Usage Commons, to be frank. So that seems like their problem, and I hope they get past it, because they shouldn't feel threatened by this. And also, it's really weird that, you know, an organization that we basically created through the donation of Kubernetes inside the Linux Foundation, which we basically helped create through the corpses of the Linux Professional Institution, the Linux Mark Institute, the Linux Standard Base, and the OSDL should be so negative uh, to working with some new organization. So, you know, whatever. Um, who actually owns the Istio trademark? Um, so the Istio trademark is an in-progress trademark in the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Um, so, you know, uh, from Google and any of the common mark laws would apply to it. Um, so the strings all over your code base, could Canada be infringing? I wouldn't think so. Uh, specifically, when I think about how we will handle the SEO trademark, again, consistent with the open source definition. I mean, our main goal, honestly, is that any project inside the OEC will never be considered non-free from the Debian perspective. So we feel that that's like the higher bar to, to, to get through. So obviously referencing Istio inside the Knative code base would be completely consistent with open source, with, with the open source definition and the Debian free software guidelines. So I wouldn't worry about that in the slightest. Um, Wait, I think there's a follow on question related to that though. Let, okay. ignoring, any, any, ignoring any potential weirdness around the Istio trademark right now, if uh -huh. it was completely transferred to the OUC, would the OUC have complete ownership of the Istio trademark or, yes. okay. Yeah, and yeah, we're not doing some game around like licensing from Google to the OUC. It's a full transfer. So okay. it's, you know, it, otherwise it wouldn't be real, you know? Um, okay. So, uh, so the LF said that under the US trademark law, you are not able to effectively separate ownership of a project mark from control of the underlying open source project. So that's actually not completely true. So if you look at how trademark law works, you need to have some technical oversight or technical impact within a given implementation of the trademark covering work. And so when you think about like, uh, so one of the things the OUC may have to do is implement and represent the output of conformance testing. Um, and so we feel that conformance testing is the way that you show that, that intimacy with the work uh, that the trademark covers. You don't have to be in ownership or control of the, like say the steering committee or the technical operating committee of a given project or have a committer by it or even have committer rights uh, in GitHub. You know, so if you look at most of our projects that we've released, there is no uh, complicated governance structure like Canadive and Istio and, and projects like Kubernetes have. We, you know, most projects that we have are, are almost single contributor, um, if you think about it. And if you look across open source in general, most projects don't have complicated structures like this, but yeah. Anyway. Uh, let's see now. Uh, why is trademark an issue suddenly right now versus just open project governance? I, I, I think that this is a orthogonal question because I think open project governance is absolutely a question all the time uh, for all projects. Um, so I think the trademark is an issue for us for a while, as I mentioned earlier in, in, in my, my, my intro there. Um, so I, I think that the question might be, I, I'm not sure I really know how to answer this question. So trademark's been an issue for us for a while, you know? Uh, we've been hitting problems with it. We've been hitting difficulty getting people to uh, accept when we when we issue trademark guidelines on a project by project basis. So we're just trying to you know have like a really good you know OSD compliant starting point for trademark. 
So yeah, as far as open project governance, that's that's you know something I'm going to push back onto the K Native Steering Committee. They 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 do their thing. I mean, I think Dan Cerulli, when he was talking about Istio's project governance, you know, he said it really well on this. Uh, there was like a podcast. Maybe we can get a link pasted. Uh, it not many people seem to be subscribed to that person, but. And anyway, uh, since Canada was not one of these projects going to the OEC, you're talking about this because Google plans uh, to, it to go there. So uh, one of the things I've said over and over again to the Canada folks is, you know, talk to me in three to six months if OEC is actually uh, useful and, and is, is making a good impact, then absolutely we'll, we'll, we'll talk about Canada. And, and at that point, I would hope that the Canada community would see it as a, as a net win as opposed to the one-off nature of the trademark guidelines around Canadian currently. Um, so, because the, the choice right now is whatever plan, whatever Google's giving to you is what the guidance is. Um, and so will OUC give guidance that's better for the commercial and open source implementers and distributors of Canadian? I, I would I would think so, um, but you gotta let me, you know, we, we again, we have just gotten started. Let us get our guidelines out there, and and through the the ringer of the Debian free software, you know, process, and 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 let people bang on it for a while until we we're sure. So, um, given oh, I haven't followed this link. Uh, it feels like Google is saying they're okay with mark ownership being lost due to ambiguous usage. Uh, you know, uh, I'm not gonna have time to probably analyze a GitHub thing. I I don't know that. Yeah, I, this is a lot to go through. Uh, sorry, this this was not in the in the briefing document up until recently, so I, I don't really know what to say. Uh, Google is not saying that I'm okay with Mark ownership being lost to into ambiguous usage. So there you go. Um, unless we have. So yeah, um, steering owns all aspects of Google and Marks. Stealing informs enforces usage of the mark. Uh, delegates to others, lawyers can declare one. There's a lot going on here. I'm just gonna let this one go, sorry. It's just, there's too much to unpack. Uh, did the projects being donated uh, to OUC choose it? By choose it, I mean choose to donate their trademarks to, uh, to OUC. Um, here's the thing, um, I, I don't wanna to sound too autocratic here, but there are some decisions that I make for Google. Um, and these three projects have a lot in common from a trademark perspective. They have third party implementers shipping them and who wanna use the words Garrett Angular or Istio when they ship them, uh, when they ship them to their customers, when they sell services around them. And also all three of them are under intensely active development. I mean, Garrett less so, Garrett's very mature, um, but Angular and Istio are under intense development inside the company. And they were getting more and more people asking them, well, I want to use it this way. I want to use the logo this way. I want to use the name that way. I want to use the mascot this way. And we wanted to stop having to do one-off answers. So one of the things about Google is we, we do so much in open source. We do so much with open source that anytime we start getting a question more than once, we need to optimize it. Otherwise, we're going to be spending all of our time in these little corner cases. So um, the, all the reason that I asked... So you see. The reason that I ask is is because I have heard like confusing things about maybe Istio voted to go to OUC, and I just I wanted to disambiguate that. Well, I mean, so then you come to the question of what's the Istio steering committee and voting structures and da 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 da. da. Uh, you know, so I, I would uh, you know pass that back to I guess uh, Dan Cerulli and those folks. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, they they voted. Or they didn't. Did they vote? Do you know? Um, there was some voting around like the blog posts and the rest. I mean, I, mean, I want to be completely upfront, Paul. The people in IBM didn't want to do this and they were overruled. So, I mean, I, 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 you know, I know that, you know, there's a lot of pussy voting around on this. And it's the reality is IBM really wants to dictate the use of, of these projects. And we disagreed with them. And yeah, so, so that. That makes it sound like steering did vote. Is that right? Again, I need to push that back on to Dan Cerulli or the other project. So a steel steering okay. committee did not vote on this. Okay, just wondering because I heard different things and it wasn't really clear. Yeah, I mean, I just need to push back on that on onto the team. So 
Uh, did Google make a unilateral decision around donation of Knative? Uh, I'm assuming this is around the CNCF non-donation of Knative that we told you about seven months ago. Uh, or will they allow the string committee determined by the community without a vendor majority to make it? So here's the cute thing. People keep on saying without a vendor majority because they say community and it's like, what do you mean by community? They're like, well, you know, the a plurality of the people who contribute to the project. And it's like, okay, um, so when? you know, in the last three months, in the last year, in the last two years since the project started, um, you know, do we intend to make a unilateral decision around donation of Canada to CNCF? We already did. So I know a lot of people didn't like that, but you know, that's, that is what it was. Um, so as far as will they allow the steering committee to determine by the community without a vendor majority to make it, there's a lot to unpack there. And I'm going to probably push that back onto the Canada folks at Google. So. So I guess uh, I think and maybe I know you, aren't you all working folks, on a new aren't you all working on a new steering document? That's yeah, that sorry. is uh, that that's true. Actually, Chris, uh, you I'm glad you brought that up um, uh, because we we have been working on refining uh, or or determining actually uh, since we're still in the sort of by fiat bootstrap phase of the steering committee how the steering committee will be composed. And Brenda, yeah. I think uh, you have drafted a document with uh, some different options that we might look at and it's shared with Knative Dev now, is that right? Yeah, I moved it into um, the Google Drive folder. I wanted to talk about this earlier in the community meeting, but I know we were running out of time, but I just put the doc in the Zoom chat. I can send out an email afterwards, but um, we've just been thinking through our different options for steering, but um, We'd love to hear the community's thoughts and comments because we want to make sure it um, is aligned with how the community is thinking about this. But um, don't want to detract from the AMA, but I'll just make sure to follow up with an email afterwards. Yeah, and I think maybe uh, like the suggestion in that doc that you were reading, Chris, got maybe edited by multiple people. So, so I was I was wondering like in in the future, like does Google intend for the steering committee in Knative to make a decision about like potentially homing the project in OUC or like, is that a Google decision? So it's worth pointing out that the OUC does not do project governance. It doesn't do project marketing. It doesn't do conferences. All it does is put together trademark guidelines. So, um, you know, when you talk about homing the project inside the OUC, that's that's just not a thing, right? So now homing the project's trademark in the OUC, it might be a better choice than having Google hold it and and decide what to do with it on a one-off basis, depending on the the sort of the weather, right? So, I mean, the reality is, ask me in three to six months. I mean, I, I have to get a lot done inside the OUC with the existing trademarks that we have before we start taking on more work. Okay. So is Google committed to a steering which has no single event? There's a lot of discussions here about Knative steering politics that I just have nothing to tell you about. Um, what's the benefit of the project owner to do this since they lose ownership of their trademark name, logo, right? But then still own the code. What's the benefit of the split of ownership? I'm reminded of the founder movie where all he wanted and all that matters was who owned. I don't, I haven't seen the movie, so. Sorry, uh, I'm sure there's something about Ray Kroc that we can draw from. Uh, yeah, um, so since they lose ownership, what's the benefit of the project owner? So in, in the case of the three projects we picked, uh, the benefit is strictly speaking that they are gonna have proper guidance in accordance with the open source definition. So it takes away the ambiguity around Google's current you know, one-off process for giving trademark permission or not permission enough, depending on whoever you, you might be. Um, and so I believe that if we can give guidance consistent with the open source definition, then the commercial concerns about if they can ship and use the word Istio or use the words Angular or whatever, uh, you know, which should go away or at least will be a lot more clear. So, you know, those who are really interested in just proprietization and, and the rest, you know, they'll have all the information they need to, to do their business. Um, just, just, but just, just to follow up that though, when it comes to making a decision in terms of whether somebody can or can't use 
for example, the logo in a particular way, mm -hmm. who makes that decision? Is it the o OUC board or is it the project owners f reading the guidance from the OUC board? Who actually can make those decisions? So for the projects that are actually in the OUC, whose trademarks are actually in the OUC, um, the, the board will be given, will, will produce guidance that can be used. And then in the case of a really contentious issue, the idea would be that there would be someone from the steering committee of that project or from the governance of that project who would represent those more complex needs beyond the OSD. So a good example of this would be, so suppose uh, if, if you think of Knative, it's not actually a, a software project, it's just a list of specifications and APIs, okay? What does it mean uh, for somebody who otherwise doesn't use a single line of code uh, from the Knative project, but presents uh, an exact, you know, 100% complete copy of it? Can they call themselves Knative, you know? Um, you know, these are the kinds of questions we get around like SDO, for instance. Um, and so what's the right answer from an OSD perspective? So uh, I'm very Apache license oriented. So everything for me is you get a grant to copyright, you get a grant to patents, and you would get a grant to trademark if you use the software. So if you're using the software, then you can say you're using the software. Right. If you decide to fork and go another direction, is the right language that you've been derived from that software or based on? We don't really know what the right one is yet, but we know there's something like that in there. If you create something that is 100% compatible but doesn't use a single line of code from that project, can you say that you are 100% compatible with Angular or Istio or something? Um, there's probably some languages that is consistent with the Debian free software guidelines, but I'd imagine the answer would be largely, yeah, probably not. Unless you're actually using the software, you can't use the name, right? Because one of the things we want to avoid are people saying, hey, I'm the, I'm the Istio project, when in fact they have not a single line of code in common. Um, so, yeah. I just want to make sure I understand the answer. So if, if there's some decision that needs to be made <clears throat> relative to usage of the trademark, that decision is no longer made by the project. It is made by the OUC, correct? Uh, around the trademark, yes. Got it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but the idea is that we would be able to not have to make any decisions unless they fall under some weird corner case in the far side of the open source definition. Because I, I actually truly believe the open source definition can give proper guidance on the use of a name and a logo and a mark. Um, and you know, uh, and uh, I guess that's why I'm the open source person at Google. But uh, yeah, so so yeah, and then the more complicated questions of API compatibility. But you know, right now we're just handling trademarks as our intellectual property. Let's talk about what APIs mean after October. So, um, what else do we have here? What's in October? Uh, that's when the Oracle uh, case hits the Supreme Court. Ah. So then we'll decide if APIs are actually a new kind of intellectual property or not. So I don't want to talk much about the Oracle lawsuit though, as you might imagine. Um, okay, uh, wh where were we? Um, let's see, across all of this, how could one begin to approach ensuring a technically conformant, non-mark infringing downstream implementation derived from the OUC project? Does OUC have a roadmap for how this project to be able to out? Um, so we've only just started talking about what conformance testing would mean um, with regard to you know, is that de facto permission to use a mark? Um, again, we're just getting started. I'd say come back and talk to us in a bit. You know, we need, need a bit of time. Um, who did Google work with for making OUC happen? Who decided to create the OUC? Was a Google unilateral decision? I'd say it was probably a unilateral decision. Um, you know, we were, we had gotten so many uh, questions about mark use the mark this way, the market use the mark that way. And I, I'll be frank with you, I thought a lot of the guidance that came out of the company was mixed. And, and sometimes I felt it may be even an additional restriction on top of the GPL or the, uh, or the Apache license, um, which is something that I've always tried to avoid at Google. So I was like, well, we need to set up. Uh, so back in the early days uh, of, of Google, you know, I was very, uh, adamant that we would not create an open source license that was going to be the Google open source license. 
and uh, and that was the right decision. We used the Apache license by default, and sometimes we would use other licenses when it made sense. You know, when you're writing kernel drivers or whatever, you use the GPL. Um, we weren't using some Google, you know, commercial source license or one of these new source licenses you've been seeing. Um, and there isn't anything like that for trademark. And so we decided that we were going to create something so that we could create that license, for lack of a better term, uh, that would be consistent with the OSD for trademark, and that was the OUC. So that was something that we had been talking about inside the company for about, oh gosh, for about a year now, uh, if it was going to be the right approach. And so that's what we decided to do. Uh, who decides who's on the OEC board? Uh, in the beginning, we just went and talked to some people who we, we, we got along with in the industry and asked them if they want to join. Some people said no, and other people said, sure, yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. So that's what we did. Reminds me of Docker renaming to Moby for trademark purposes. Um, that did not work out too well for Docker popularity and trust. Docker's popularity and trust is not my problem, so I'm going to skip that. Um, since OUC must own the trademark after other foundations, uh, also expect to own the trademark. Uh, How does OUC uh, providing? Chris, yes. Uh, I think uh, we we are several minutes over time now, but oh, and some okay. of these questions are starting to repeat with questions that we asked that were asked before. So I wanted to propose that if anybody that is still on the call has questions, please add them on this talk, and we will have them responded uh, by the end of this week. And if that sounds okay to everybody? Sure. I, I think that sounds good. I think there's clearly a lot of interest from our community and like understanding the yeah. details. So, so Chris, I, I'd love to, to maybe have you back in uh, a future community meeting um, uh, to talk about, you know, progress that you made since, since you're sort yeah. of bootstrapping I mean, that. We, we were really just getting started. I would, I would actually really appreciate that, you know, um, just having a little bit of time to get some actual work done. I yeah, mean, maybe one of the, it can be like one of the terrible months. things about being Google is you can't do anything without everyone really needing to know everything about it. And it's like, you know, we're, we're in the middle of working on it right now. So I, I'd love to tell you that we're going to get it all right first pass, but there's no way. So we're going to need people to comment on it and, and tell us what's, what's right and what's wrong. So I'd really appreciate that. May I ask uh, like one final question? And it's not a it's not a trick question. I sure. I really just want to know like how will you measure success in the next three to six ah, months? Okay, I would measure success specifically if people take a look at uh, the guidance that we produce and start using it. Like they say, hey, we've got a trademark. Uh, we're gonna, just going to use that stuff because it's already been figured out. They, Google's already taken it on the chin and figured out good guidance around these things. So I'm just going to use that. You know, that would be a great outcome. So that that would be, you know, dreams beyond that of average. So. Uh, I cool. Thank think, you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining and staying this long and having this conversation. I think it, it's important to to have a a good understanding of what the Open Usage Commons organization is doing. Uh, please make sure that you fill out the survey for this meetup and give us feedback on the on the content and the event overall. Uh, we didn't have a lot of time for networking this time, but I hope to bring that back next time. And thank you, Chris, for joining and uh, responding to questions as well. Sure. Thanks for having I me. Shared, I shared the link to the survey on the chat right here. Please take a few minutes to, to fill that out. Thank you. Thanks for coming, everybody. See ya.